Look at these two images. The orange circles in the center are actually the same size, but the one on the right looks bigger because the circles surrounding it are smaller. It appears bigger because our minds judge based on what else is around. So, what does this have to do with happiness? Well, a lot, says the author of Predictably Irrational, the hidden forces that shape our decisions. That's Dan Ariely, and he's a behavioral economist at Duke University. So how, how is happiness relative? Uh, happiness is relative in many, in many ways. Uh, first of all, we compare our own happiness to our own past self. So if you ask yourself how happy you are, how do you judge that? Based on what? How you happy I was yesterday or last how year. How happy I was last year. And also you judge it based on other people around you. And it's interesting to realize that both of those ways of judging our happiness have some mistakes in them. So, for example, if you surround yourself by lots of very successful, uh, very happy-looking people, you would compare yourself to that and you would be uh, very miserable. If you surround yourself by lots of people who are uh, miserable, you'll actually be relatively happier. So we should look for miserable friends? Well, they have other effects, but uh, I, I would recommend having a few, at least a few miserable friends. Um, you were burned severely in an accident in Israel when you were 18, and this affected your take on happiness. How? So, so I was burning about 70% of my body, and I, I spent about three years in hospital. In the beginning of life in hospital, I was incredibly miserable because my counterfactual, the reality I compared myself to was my past reality. But after quite a few plus years... Plus you were in pain. Plus I was in pain. Uh, actually, I'm still in pain, but not as much as I, as I had. But, uh, but over a while in hospital, my social reference and framework changed, and I started comparing myself to other people that were around me, my own image of myself as healthy kind of faded away, and my, my happiness climbed because I had this comparison. And then actually it was incredibly difficult that when I left hospital and I uh, went into normal life, uh, all of a sudden I realized how more handicapped and limited I was compared to how it was before. When I was in hospital, the whole environment was set up for people with disability. Everybody around me had some disability my comparison to that. And the first And you were improving. And I was improving. There was a fantastic feeling that, you know, now is better than a month ago and every operation helped me a little bit and so on. But all of a sudden when I left hospital, presumably a great achievement, uh, I encountered a very different frame of reference around me. Everybody was healthy. Everything in life was designed for people who had no disabilities. And that actually was incredibly uh, disheartening and hard to deal with. And from my reporting, I have been struck by how people who've had terrible accidents, paraplegics, often seem to report similar happiness levels to everybody else. Yeah. And so are you saying you're just as happy now as you would have been if you had the accident not had happened? So, so, so I think in some sense, uh, I'm not as happy, I think, as I would have. Uh, the thing that I'm not used to is pain. So I have lots of pain in my uh, right hand, and if I write like a page or two a day, I'm okay, but if I have to write more than that, I have a lot of pain, and that's something that is very hard to get used to. So I got used to lots of things. I can't use my hands very well. From functional things, I get used to it. I have some other challenges I get used to. it. Pain is one of those things that is very hard to get used to because I feel it every day. Without the pain, you might be as happy as you would have been without the act. I, I think so, and uh, in, in fact, uh, not just as happy, perhaps even slightly happier. Because again, if you think about happiness being relative, I have this incredible, painful, difficult memory of life in hospital. So when I look at uh, every day now uh, of, my, of my life, I say, how much better is this than this other misery I suffered? So you know, it's hard to say that I'm recommending as a public policy that we burn <laughs> people and put them in hospital, but, but it does have some positive uh, contrast. So when bad things happen to me right now, I think I put them in a much better perspective, thinking these are just small bumps in a row, no reason to take them too seriously, because I have this big contrast to how miserable life could really be. And on the flip side of that, you talk to lottery winners. People enter the lottery, they think, gee, if I win, life is perfect, no more money worries, and they are ecstatically happy for a week, a month, and then a year later, very little difference. Yeah. So, so we call this the hedonic treadmill. And the idea is that when you look at your life and you say, what would happen if my life improved? I got a new car, a new apartment, I won the lottery. You say, my goodness, I'll be really happy. And indeed, people are happy. But this happiness is shorter lived than they think it would be. And after a while, there's adaptation process in which it goes down. 
but you go back in your memory and you say, last time I bought the car, I was so happy. I'm not happy now. Let me renovate my kitchen. So people do this. They get this increase in spending to get happiness. They get a little bit of happiness. It goes down. They do it again and again and again. And we call this the hedonic treadmill because we keep on trying to look for happiness, but we end up running in place. But, but like all kinds of other things, this has the good side and the bad side. The bad side is that we get used to happy things. The good side is we get used to bad things. So bad things happen to you, think I'll be really miserable for a long time, ends up not as bad. That recovers too. So the message is, if there's something you don't like, do it all at once. That's, that's absolutely right. So imagine you're facing a task that you really hate, something really terrible to take you a long time. You're saying, this is terrible. And then what you want to do is you want to break it. And you say, I really want to break. I really want ice cream. I want to check Facebook. I want to do something else. But the fact is you would adopt. So it would start being very negative, and after a while you would get used to it and used to it. The third hour is not going to be as bad as the first hour. And if you stop and you take a break, you would catch it back. On the downside, it would get even worse. So you want to take bad things and do them all at once, and good things take breaks. So you're really enjoying something? Take a break. Stretch it out. Let's say you're going to remodel your home, and that's going to make you happy. The instinct is, let's get it done, and then I can live in it longer. That's but right. you say, space it out. Get a new sofa. Enjoy it for a while until the sofa loses its newness and you it fades into the background. Then get a new television. Enjoy it for a while until it fades into the background. Then change your cutlery or whatever you want to decide, but doing it steps over time. Rather than get everything at once, be very happy, but having it fade away. In, in this economic uh, difficulty, by the way, the same thing happens when you're trying to cut down on expenditure. So you sit there and you, you, you don't have enough money to pay for lots of things. And the question is, how should you cut your expenditure? Should you cut one thing every two months? Or should you take a big blow, cut a lot of your spending now? Your answer is big blow right now. Big blow right now. Now, researcher Al Andrew Clark found that job satisfaction is strongly correlated with changes in workers' pay rather than how much they get paid. And same argument. The same argument. So ask yourself, what would you prefer? to make $62,000 a year in an organization that everybody makes below you, or to make $64,000 a year in a, an organization that you're the lowest paid employee. And when you think about it, it turns out that your relative position, like you're losing $2,000. You're losing 2,000 bucks, right. How and, and, it feels, and it feels bad, but the reality is that day to day you would get used to that framework, and being the highest, most valuable employee would feel good on every day and being the lowest comparison to everybody else. Everybody else is driving better cars than you. They have better clothes. That would just drive you crazy day to day. The sad thing is if we give people these two jobs and you say, what would you be happy? Everybody recognizes being the highest paid employee in the low paying job is better. But when you ask people, what will you take? Very few people actually take the thing that would make them happier. It kind of feels bad to choose a lower paying job, even if you know it will make you happy.